knuckles and all your edges All your perfect imperfections Give it all to me I give my all to you You're my friend and my beginning Even when I lose a win Could I give you all
Even though what you was doing wasn't tasteful Even though you out here looking so ungrateful I'ma keep it moving, be classy and graceful I told him it's no friends that came, you ain't learned that yet All the bitches you came over, do not burn that yet Niggas not respect, niggas ain't earn that yet Self-righteous and entitled, but they swear in the Bible That they love you and really they ain't different from all your rivals But I feel on with death on them, I just reflect on them You when it's beneficial I must forgive, I won't forgive But I'm a dead to issue As soon as you out the niggas' lives Is when they start to miss you They see you doing good now It's kinda hard to dish you Niggas be sick when they remember All the bad they wished you Niggas be mad when they can't come And live lavish with you But I sped off in the bin seat I see the ends When I'm off the frenzy So I pop pills for them Pop crooks in the hills on them Pills and potions
Welcome to you from the English service of Voice of Nigeria. So nice of you to join us here on this broadcast today, Friday, the second day of June 2017. My name is Kaman Igoche. I'm your duty continuity announcer on this segment of broadcast of programs. And we'll be together from now until about the next one and a half hours. We'll be starting off very shortly at the top of the hour. That's 18 hours Greenwich Mean Time with 60 minutes. 
60 Minutes is a one-hour news magazine that brings you all the latest happenings here in Nigeria and across the world. There's also economic news and sports news today in history. And an African proverb system with us for 60 minutes, taking the air very shortly at 18 hours Greenwich Mean Time. Our last program for this segment of broadcast will be theatre on the air at 19 hours Greenwich Mean Time. And this, this week's edition of the program will be looking at change and where change starts. I'm sure you already know the answer to that. But stay with us for the program Theatre on the Air where you will learn so much more about where change starts. Now you're free to visit our website, that's at www.von.gov.ng, where you can listen to audio streaming of our programs, programs and also find out the latest news headlines and so much more about Voice of Nigeria. And we're also over on Twitter, where you can also come and interact with us. Our, t our handle on Twitter is at Voice of Nigeria. Now the time has come up to 18 hours, Greenwich Mean Time. Seven PM local time, eighteen hours Greenwich Mean Time. Welcome to Sixty Minutes, an hour of news, views, reports, and analysis of issues coming to you from Voice of Nigeria, broadcasting from Abuja. The live streaming on www.von.gov.ng, and we bring you news as it breaks on our Twitter handle at Voice of Nigeria on our big story. In a bid to avert imminent food crisis, the Nigerian government is stopping the re-emergence of army room, a food pest that's fast spreading across the country. The question is how? We'll bring you details in the course of the program. And on the headlines, Nigeria to spend over $180 million to combat piracy. At least 15 children die in South Sudan vaccine contamination. UN condemns U.S. withdrawal from Paris Climate Agreement. Details of these and more, including economic and sports news, today in history and, of course, an African proverb, will be coming up on this edition of 60 Minutes. My name is Glory Ohago. Welcome and stay tuned. Our curtain raiser is the bulletin of the world news and Kaman Igorje is here to do justice to that. Kaman, welcome. Thank you so much, Glory. It's good to be here. Nigeria will spend over $180 million to combat piracy in a bid to safeguard its waters and vessels moving in and out of the country. Minister of Transportation Rotimi Amechi stated this in a speech at NOR Shipping's inaugural Africa podium in Oslo, Norway. He said the fund was meant to acquire three new ready-for-war ships, three aircrafts, 12 vessels, and 20 amphibious vehicles to combat the menace of piracy in the Gulf of Guinea. The transport minister revealed that over the next six months, the Nigerian government would give additional training to its navy while providing technical and further support to patrol vessels in the region. The Nigerian government says it will address the plight of the displaced persons in Bakasi in line with the policy on serving the interest of all Nigerians regardless of their affiliations. Acting President Professor Yemi Oshimbajo stated this while responding to issues raised by stakeholders at the town hall meeting in Calabar, organized in continuation of the series of engagements with leaders in the Niger Delta region. Professor Oshimbajo said the seeding of Bakasi as a result of the judgment of the International Court of Justice was a development that would be considered a loss. The acting president said the Buhari administration would not hesitate to support viable programs and initiatives that would make life better for Nigerians. The Nigerian government says it has finalized plans with South African investors to commence mining operations at the abandoned coal mines in Enugu. The Director General Voice of Nigeria, Osita Okechuku, who led South African investors, Siman Group, 
said the new development was in fulfillment of President Muhammadu Buhari's promises made to Igbos to revamp coal for power generation. Mr. Okechuku said the visit was the reason why the investors were in Enugu to meet with the governor and discuss modalities of operations. The Enugu state governor, Ifai Uwai, expressed his readiness to partner with the group for the realization of the goal. Moving on, the National Commission for Refugees and Internally Displaced Persons says it will continue to protect and promote the, the dignity of IDPs through material and financial interventions. The Federal High Commissioner, Sadia Far Farouk, said this while presenting some relief materials to the IDPs in Durumi Camp, Abuja. She said that the Commission remains committed to keying into the, recov the recovery plans for the North East as envisioned by the President administration. We appreciate you because we know you organize yourselves in a very orderly manner. We've not heard any complaints about the IDPs that are here in Durimi and I urge you to continue being more abiding citizens of this country. So on behalf of the federal government of Nigeria, under the leadership of President Mohammed Buhari, uh, through the National Commission for Refugees, Migrants and IDPs, we are here today to hand over this relief material to you. Some of the relief materials include school materials, sorted foodstuffs and drug commodities. National Orientation Agency, NOA, has urged stakeholders in the reconstruction process in the northeast of Nigeria to streamline the requirements of abandoned young people in the area. The Director General of NOA, Dr. Garba Abari, made the call in an interaction with the British High Commission's Head of Counter-Terrorism, Mr. James McCormick, who visited the agency to seek areas of synergy in strategic communication towards countering violent extremism in Nigeria. Dr. Abari said the agency was following up on its counter-terrorism interventions by developing a counter-extremism narrative to discourage young people in the Northeast from engaging in acts of terror. On his part, the British High Commission's counter-terrorism chief, Mr. Makomi, noted that Britain has lessons to learn from Nigeria in the face of recent terror attacks in that country and was willing to share experience with Nigeria. Australia has expressed its readiness to support Nigeria's quest to tackle insecurity and corruption. The Special Envoy for Human Rights of the Australian Prime Minister, Mr. Dario Morosini, stated this when he visited the Permanent Secretary in Nigeria's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador Shola Enikanulaye in Abuja. He said that he was in Nigeria as part of his country's efforts to galvanize support for a strong global commitment towards sustaining the human rights of all citizens. The envoy conveyed his government's con commendation over the rescue of the Chibok girls, which he described as a testament of government's commitment to ensuring the preservation of the rights of its citizens. And at least 15 children have died in South Sudan after health workers vaccinating them against measles used the same syringe without sterilizing it. A report prepared by a committee of specialists in the country found the children had died from severe sepsis toxicity as a result of the vaccine's contamination caused by repeated use of an unsterilized syringe. The health minister, Riek Guy Kok, said the team that vaccinated the children in this tragic event were neither qualified nor trained for the immunization campaign. South Sudan had struggled to provide basic services such as health care since it descended into civil war in December 2013. And moving on to Zimbabwe, where the president, Robert Mugabe, has begun a series of rallies across the country in a bid to win the support of young people ahead of elections next year. Reports said huge crowds had gathered for the rally in a stadium at Marondera, east of the capital, Harare. It added that President Mugabe was planning nine other similar rallies this year. President Mugabe has been in power since 1980 and is due to run again in 2018. France says security conditions are still not right to reopen its embassy in Libya. Foreign Ministry spokesman Roma Nadal said France would reopen the embassy in Tripoli as soon as security conditions become right. 
The head of the government of National Accord, Fayez Al Siraj, said on May 30 that the new president, that the new president Emmanuel Macron, had promised to reopen the embassy as early as possible. France closed its embassy in Tripoli in 2014 amid growing instability in Libya. And the United Nations says the decision by the United States to withdraw from the Paris Climate Agreement is a disappointment for global efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and promote global security. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres stated this in New York shortly after U.S. President Donald Trump announced his country's withdrawal from the agreement. He said the Paris Agreement was adopted by all nations in the world in 2015 because they recognized the immense harm that climate change was already causing and the enormous opportunity that climate action presents. The Secretary General said he remained confident that cities, states and businesses within the U.S. along with other countries would continue to demonstrate vision and leadership. And that's the much we can take on the World News Bulletin. It's now back to you, Glory. Bulletin of the World News there, uh, presented by Kaman Igorche. She'll be back in the course of the program with news about Nigeria. The program is 60 minutes, an hour of news, views, reports and analysis of issues Coming to you from the voice of Nigeria, broadcasting from Abuja. We're live streaming on www.von.gov.ng. The National Commission for Refugees, Migrants and Internally Displaced Persons has kicked off the first phase of its interventions for IDPs in Abuja, the nation's capital. The Federal High Commissioner, Sadia Farouk, so the gesture is a demonstration of the Commission's commitment to assisting IDPs in the Federal Capital Territory. Raila Lasso was there for Voice of Nigeria and now reports. Presenting the relief materials, the Federal High Commissioner Hajia Sadia Farouk says that the gesture is only a beginning of the Commission's intervention. According to her, the Commission is ramping up its 2017 activities to focusing heavily on economic empowerment based on its assessment of pilots' projects. Carried out. We're carrying out all of our responsibilities to these people and we're planning towards bringing soccer to you people. This is the first phase of our intervention and we hope to do more in the very near future. We want to teach you how to get your own food. So our subsequent intervention will be in areas of empowerment. One of the IDPs, Mr. Idris Hadi Luru, spoke on behalf of the IDPs, appreciated the gesture of the Commission. We have been elected, we still have, and we thank the Honorable Commissioner for that effort. We thank the government of President uh, Muhammad Buhari for listening to us, because the previous government was saying that there's no supposed to be IDP in Abuja. I ask you, is there any place that an IDP is supposed to be? An IDP is kept it. We didn't need to meet ourselves in Abuja. Everybody came a different year, some four years, some five years, some just... So we are happy that uh, the Honorable Commissioner led a such high level of uh, management team to come and uh, present this item to us. Mr. Halili, however, asked for a befitting accommodation for the IDPs, as most of them live in makeshift houses not suitable for the rainy season. For Voice of Nigeria, I am Rehila Lassa reporting. Thank you, Raila. Relative peace has been restored in Northeast Nigeria with the decimation of Boko Haram. With the restoration of the peace, girls who have been out of school due to the activities of the insurgents in the area have been urged to return to school. Founder of Khartoum Foundation, a non-governmental organization, Ms. Khartoum Mohammed, who made a call in an interview with Voice of Nigeria in Abuja, disclosed that the NGO was facilitating the rehabilitation of girls affected by the activities of Boko Haram. Ms. Mohammed also explained to correspondent Tamitoka Mustafa other activities of the NGO in Northeast Nigeria. My NGO is all about encouraging girl child education in the Northeast Nigeria, more especially in Borno and Yobi. Girls mostly, they don't go to school, they don't emphasize on educating their children. So I'm campaigning on that. And after that, it's also about religious tolerance. 
to tolerate one another. Well, good enough to know that the NGO is all about educating girls and then helping them to be reintegrated back into the society in the most eastern part of Nigeria. Now, I would like to know what's the objective? What do you really want to achieve? What I want to achieve is that to touch lives of people in the northeast. That is my main objective. And that, uh, more especially, uh, girls or women. So, how do you intend to touch lives of these girls and women? Well, by educating them, there is uh, something that I'm planning to do now, to open a school, to camp uh, hun uh, like 100 uh, girls, to feed them, educate them, look after them. I think it will help in this way. Well, you just talked about a program you're planning to bring up, and I must tell you that that is commendable. But where do you intend to get these girls from, about 100 girls? How do you get support? to feed them for free and then give them education. I'll get them from camp because there are many children that don't have parents now. They are often, I will take them from different camps and then look after them. When we talk about education, what focus are you giving for the education of these girls? Is it about skills empowerment or normal education, conventional school system? How do you believe intend to give them this education. What kind of education? Quranic education or how? I will give them both. Uh, I will train them, give them, uh, train them a hand skill, teach them normal education and uh, everything that would be good for them. How do you want to make them believe in what you want to do? How do you want to encourage them to believe in what you are planning for them? Well, first of all, I will uh, give them example as I myself. If I didn't go to school, I won't be able to help anyone. Why do you intend to discourage women, girls, from participating in terrorist activities and then taking part in a suicide bombing? I've done many seminars and workshops. I've been inviting scholars there and pastors. So that's how I would convince them. And also by telling them that killing themselves is not a, a way out. They should stop killing themselves. And also, that if they have been facing challenges, Everything would, would go back to normal. This is not the end of their lives. Like for example, if there are women that have been raped. So instead of them to come out, to come out and fight it out, they will decide to kill themselves. So I will discourage them to stop doing this. Because we like them, we will take care of them. And their life will go back to normal. Ms. Hurton Mohammed is the founder of Hurton Foundation based in Northeast Nigeria. And now our bird story. A meeting between the 36 seats commissioners and Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development to talk of the re-emergence of army worm in the country has been held in Abuja, the nation's capital. The meeting deliberated on how to combat the menace and avert an imminent food crisis as it's fast spreading across different zones in the country. Most of Nigeria correspondent Enne Okwanihe in this special reports takes a look at how the army worm operates and government's plan to bring the devastating effects under control. The army worm has a rapid development with a very short life cycle as it morphs lays about 100 to 400 eggs in batches. The eggs develop in different stages and every stage has its devastating effects on plants. But the most dangerous stage of development is the stage 4 because it feeds more which is the stage where the ones attacking these farms in Nigeria right now are. The army worm completes its food cycle within 25 to 30 days, and all that moth has the ability to lay 1,000 eggs in its lifespan. It can cause 90 to 95 percent damage to an entire maize field within 48 hours. The Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development in Nigeria has therefore raised an alarm over this situation and is taking steps to bring the outbreak of army worm under control. The Minister of Agriculture, Mr. Aldote, while discussing the outbreak with the 36 states commissioners of agriculture, including the FCT, said Amiron is destroying maize production in the country and poses serious threat to not only maize production but to other important crops. Mr. Aldo also said the pest, which is currently attacking farms across the country, also poses threat to the poultry industry, which, if not controlled, 
to result in the skyrocketing of prices of poultry products, as maize is one of the major crops used for the production of poultry feeds in the country. This is the nature of agricultural diseases keep coming. You can't always know from what source. But they move around, they arrive in places and then cause havoc. The impact of uh, the shortage of maize has been severe on poultry. And uh, definitely for a country that's facing food challenges in the North East in particular, we can't afford to let it continue. Mr. Obey, however, added that the government is enlisting the service of an agrochemical company to provide pesticides that can be used to combat the animal worm. The enlisted company will also carry out sensitization campaigns across the state and local governments to make sure farmers are well enlightened on how to use the pesticides to prevent and control animal worm. Meanwhile, the Deputy Director of Horticulture at the Ministry, Dr. Mike Kano, in his presentation titled The African Animal Worm Infestation and Proposed Control Strategies in Nigeria, said that a total of 2.98 billion naira will be needed to contain the test for about 700,000 hectares of land affected across the country. Dr. Kano said Nigeria is at a critical stage right now where an organic pesticide has to be used to bring the situation under control. He, however, emphasized the need to use an organic pesticide that will not leave residues as usage of any harmful pesticide has damaging effect on the human health. The army worm is believed to have migrated to Nigeria from the Nile Republic through Oyo State. And aside means, it attacks other crops including grasses, sorghum, barley, millet, wheat, and rice. Other crops that harbor the pest include cotton, tomato, groundnut, and ginger and they are found in high-density areas. Currently, the pest has spread to the southeastern part of the country, the southwestern part, the south-south, the northeast, and the northwestern part of the country. For Voice of Nigeria, I am Emma Opanihi, reporting. Nigerian farmers have expressed their satisfaction with the measures being taken by the government to record bumper harvest of agricultural products and also ensure food security across the country this year. The farmers made the position known to journalists in Abuja when the chairman of the Abuja Municipal Area Council, Mr. Abdullahi Adamo Candido, distributed modern farm implements, seedlings and bags of fertilizers free to farmers to aid their farming activities. Uri Yakubo was there for Voice of Nigeria and our reports. In a bid to boost agricultural production and food security in the Nigeria Federal Capital Territory, about 1,800 bags of fertilizer have been distributed to farmers in the territory. The excess was launched by the chairman of Abuja Municipal Area Council, Mr. Abdullahi Ademu Kandido, in the nation's capital, Abuja. In particular, the council disclosed that about three trailers loads of 1,200 bags of MPK and 600 bags of urine fertilizer have been procured for free distribution to farmers across the 12 political wards of the council so as to boost their crops yield this farming season. The Selki Moma Gwagwa, Mr. Sunusi Zuberu, explained what is used to be with them before the excise. The challenge is the chemical that we, spray, we want to spray, like the herbicide, homicide, uh, all this against the seed that kills our plants and also the, 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 all this fly where we use attack our farms. That is our challenge. And also the health man. It's also another challenge eh, for us because every year, every year we used to have a problem with them. So we went to make uh, an appeal to the government to please talk to this headman. Speaking while officially flagging off the distribution of the crop stimulant in Apu, the AMAC chairman, Abdullah Adamukandidu, said that it is important to farmers cannot be overemphasized as it is the essential input that help farmers to boost their crop production. He noted that more than ever, encouragement of farming activities must be intensified in the light of the green green trend in the other sectors of the economy, which underscore the federal government resort to revive back to agriculture. As far as I remain the chairman of this area council, year in year out, our farming season will roll out fertilizer free of charge. I don't, you know, I'm not part of this idea of uh, subsidizing the rate. No, this thing should go free to the farmer so that we can boost the yield.
according to him, the council prior to the commencement of 2017 farming season in April had earlier started subsidized armored tractors hiring service in February. He added that selected councillors, political appointees, community chiefs, and certain number as well as ward chairman of all progressive congress, one each from the 12 political ward, will form part of the committee to share the fertilizers to farmers. While advising the beneficiary to ensure the judicious use the purpose it was procured, the chairman warned stakeholders against exporting farmers by holding or selling the items given free of charge. For Voice of Nigeria, I am Pudi Okubu, reporting. We now move to legislative issues. Stakeholders in the oil and gas sector have advocated for the broadening of the nation's economy towards a gas-based industrial economy for the diversification to yield fruitful results. Participants at a workshop on the Petroleum Industry Bill, organized by the House of Representatives Committee on Petroleum Upstream, said Nigeria has to strengthen the value added sectors of refining and petrochemicals for the sector to contribute to the diversification. Mr. Victor Mokolo from Delta State Southern Nigeria is a chairman of the House Committee on Petroleum Upstream. He speaks on the reason for the workshop. What we are doing today is again to acquaint members or to refresh them of what we have done in the past. <coughs> the, the bill, of course, I've gone through first reading, and by, well, by the grace of God, as from next week, it will go to second reading and it will be given as an effect um, <coughs> attention that it requires. It is true, like you said, it has passed in the Senate, that what the Senate have done, they've only taken only a fraction part of it, only one third of it. What is referred as petroleum <coughs> industrial governance bill is what they have passed. And in the case of House of Representatives, we are taking it holistically. Like you saw in the newspaper, if you read Nation or one or other two papers for Sunday, you find the General National Youth saying that they don't agree with what the Senate have done because the issue of host community has not been addressed. And if you are also following the proceedings in the House of Reps, you agree with me that we are taking it holistically because we have dealt with the Petroleum uh, Industry Governance Bill. We have also uh, gone to the physical and the host community bill. So we are taking it at, we are taking it holistically so that no, no session of it will be left out. That was uh, the Chairman House of Representatives Committee on Petroleum Upstream. Mr. Victor Mokolo. We now move to bilateral relations. South Sudan is soliciting Nigeria's support in the resolution of the internal crisis in the country. South Sudanese Foreign Affairs Minister Mr. Deng Khoi, who made the appeal when he visited the Nigerian Minister of Foreign Affairs in Abuja, Nigeria, expressed optimism that Nigeria has the capacity to resolve the crisis in his country. Mr. Koi, in an interview with journalists, also requested Nigeria's assistance and support in developing South Sudan's health, education, and the country's oil sectors. Nigeria played a very important role during the war in Sudan. Nigeria mediated you know, peace agreement, and Nigeria has been you know, very close to both Sudan and South Sudan. We came to discuss bilateral issues, issues of cooperation in different areas uh, where Nigeria can help us, education, health, and the oil sector. We are an oil producing country. We, we need Nigerian expertise. We need Nigerian oil companies to go and invest uh, in South Sudan. And the issue of peace, you know, we, are, we have an internal world and we want also Nigeria to have us. So we want also Nigeria to come and play a role, a major role, in, in bringing all the parties uh, together and implement the peace agreement that we signed last year in August. Uh, about um, Nigeria campaigning in the crisis in South Sudan, uh, are you hopeful that uh, Nigeria's intervention can go a long way in bringing the peace that you seek? Oh yes, I'm very, very much hopeful because this is not the first time for Nigeria to get involved. And Nigeria, under President Ibrahim Babangida in 1992, hosted here uh, peace, uh, peace talks between SPL and the government of Sudan. And that led to what became known as uh, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, which was brokered by the region also with participation in Nigeria, and which brought a final peace to Sudan in 2005. 
as the Dan Coy is South Sudan's Minister of Foreign Affairs. Responding at the Nigerian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Jeff Yanyama, pledged Nigeria's commitment to enthroning peace and finding lasting solutions to the crisis in South Sudan. Mr. Yanyama disclosed that President Mohamed Buhari has always shown keen interest in addressing the internal crisis in South Sudan. President Mohamed Buhari is uh, fully engaged in um, helping, first of all, uh, with regards to the security challenges in South Sudan, uh, helping to, to bring peace and to maintain peace and sustain peace uh, in South Sudan. That was Mr. Jeff Yama, Nigeria's Minister of Foreign Affairs. Do you know the look of a suicide bomber? Not usually in loose or heavy clothing usually inappropriate for the weather. They carry bags or packages. They tighten their hands or keep them in their pockets. They are unaware of their surroundings, always alone and nervous. They'll be found driving cars moving very fast or extremely slow. Be vigilant. Be security conscious. Report suspicious persons, objects and movements to the police and other security agencies. Security is a duty for you and me. Unite again. You're listening to Prime Time News, reaching you from Voice of Nigeria on 60 Minutes, an hour of news, views, reports, and analysis of issues live streaming on www.vun.gov.ng. 7.30 p.m. local time, 18.30 Greenwich Mean Time. Still to come, news about Nigeria, economic news, sports news, today in history, and of course an African proverb. But before all those, the top stories in the hour's news. Nigeria will spend over $180 million to combat piracy in a bid to safeguard its waters and vessels moving in and out of the country. Minister of Transportation, Rotini Amechi, stated this in a speech at Nor Shipping Inaugural Africa Podium in Oslo, Norway. From South Sudan, at least 15 children have died in early May after health workers vaccinating them against measles used the same syringe without sterilizing them. And globally, United Nations says the decision by the United States to withdraw from the Paris Climate Change Agreement it's a disappointment for global efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and promote global efforts and global security. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres stated this in New York shortly after US President Donald Trump announced his country's withdrawal from the agreement. Those were the top stories in the hour's news. 60 Minutes continues right away, but not before a quick reminder that you can cop all the news we have online on www.von.gov.ng. The Nigerian government has pledged its commitment to provide all the necessary support to girl child as part of efforts to promote gender parity in the country. Nigeria's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mrs. Jeffrey Onyema, Nigeria's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Jeffrey Onyama, made a pledge when the UN Women Representative for Nigeria, Ms. Comfort Lamte, presented a letter of permission to him in Abuja, Nigeria. Ms. Onyama disclosed that apart from education, the government has a robust social intervention program for women entrepreneurs to access credits for the development of their businesses. Our commitment is total. As you know, Mr. President, um, first of all, has a ministry for women's affairs, which clearly shows that uh, this government um, is, is committed to providing all the support to push towards greater gender parity uh, in this uh, country. And also, um, Mr. President's um, social intervention program, women are very prominent in that, um, helping women entrepreneurs, business people, access and credit and so forth. It's a very big part of that program, as well as um, skills development. Development uh, for women, and as you know, also Mr. President attaches very great importance to the education of women. Nigerian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Jeffrey Onyama, on her part, UN Women Representative in Nigeria, Ms. Comfort Lamte, 
said the mandate of UN Women is the empowerment of women all around the world. Ms. Lamjay, in an interview with journalists, explains how she intends to achieve this mandate in Nigeria. UN Women is the United Nations entity for gender equality. The UN Women was established as an independent agency in 2010, basically to respond to the developing challenges facing women around the world. UN Women actually works across uh, many countries in the world, or we're present in over 80 countries in the world. And in Nigeria, we've been present here since the establishment of the organization. Before UN Women was established, we were a small fund called the um, UNIFEM and uh, so we've transitioned into UN Women and uh, with the establishment of UN Women there's also been the high expectations of, of us to deliver for women's rights around the world. Ms. Comfort Lamte is the UN Women Representative for Nigeria. And moving on, the need to explore cheap land availability in Plateau State, North Central Nigeria has been advocated for. The call was made by the managing director, One Care Integrated Service, the construction company in Joss, and the foundation stone laying ceremony of the 3,000 housing units in Joss, south local government area of the state. Mwala Fadile was there for Voice of Nigeria and now reports. The groundbreaking ceremony for the construction of affordable residential housing under the Plateau State Public Private Partnership Agreement, in conjunction with We Care Integrated Services Limited, is in line with one of the five policy trusts of the Government Land Rescue Administration, which is Physical Infrastructure and Environment. The Executive Governor of the State, Simon Lallon, who was ably represented by the Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Housing and Urban Development, Mr. Sami Abidaka, in a speech said just how the housing deficit of 240,000 units for accommodation of urban population. He, however, assured citizens of government efforts. With the repetition of the memorandum of understanding with the 15 property developers, we will be delivering about 10,000 housing units of 20 and 2 bedroom apartments under the pleasure of Master Plan. The property developer's commitment to providing construction from primary infrastructure and payment for land has led the mobilization of all sectors from public service and other willing to be in. Also speaking of the managing director, we care integrated services. The housing developer, who is partnering with the Plato State Government, Mr. Nam Pong Pimbon. Mr. Pimbon, who commanded the state government for the Lovingu Initiative, also spoke of the focus of the project. This project is focused on providing two and three bedroom units in the new town concept with all integrated infrastructure and services developed by the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development to mitigate the earlier mentioned tragedies. The first phase of this project is to provide over 700 units in four different sites. The chairman just South local government whose domain these structures are going to be erected thanks the state government for the continuous effort in ensuring that citizens are comfortable. He, however, made an appeal. I want to appeal to the state government and the conversion that even if this house comes to be, if they are going to be sold to civil servants and other people outside the confines of the town of the government, at the cost of 1,000 naira, for instance, I am appealing on behalf of our people that they should be sold to us at the cost of 500 naira. By the time these residential houses are completed, citizens of Plato State will enjoy comfortable and affordable housing. For Voice of Nigeria, I am Omolola Fabini, reporting. And from just Plateau State, North Central Nigeria will move to Kenya, where campaigns for who occupies the office of the president is now in top gear, with elections just about two months away. As with the previous elections, incumbent president Uhuru Kenyatta and challenger Raila Odinga regained the main candidate for the elections, which will hold in August 2017. But it holds not. Is different about the next polls as Voice of Nigeria correspondent Ayola Tafunkoya reports. 
Both Uhuru Kenyatta and Raila Odinga are no strangers to the role for Kenya's top job. And they are not the only candidates in the race this time. The rest of the six candidates are not likely to make any significant uh, dents in the polls, uh, either for President Uhuru Kenyatta or Raila Odinga. Barak Moluka is a Kenyan political analyst. He believes the poll will be a two-horse race between Mr. Kenyatta and Mr. Odinga. Apart from Okuru Okok, so who was uh, on the panel of eminent uh, persons that uh, drafted the constitution of Kenya 2010, hardly anything is known about uh, the rest of the people. Some of the other candidates, we're hearing about them for the first time uh, since just uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago. Meanwhile, the political terrain and conditions in Kenya are completely different than those of four years ago. The most fundamental difference is that uh, Uhuru Kenyatta comes uh, into the race this time round with uh, what may variously be seen as the advantage or even the baggage for that matter of uh, incumbency. And conversely, the other side uh, will be looking at uh, what they may want to call uh, his failures. In 2013, President Kenyatta and his deputy, William Ruto, had charges pending at the International Criminal Court over their alleged roles in elections that left many dead years ago. Many believe those charges won them sympathy votes. But that factor is not expected to play a significant role in the next elections following the withdrawal of the charges, says Mr. Moluka. At that time, uh, Uhuru Kenyatta and uh, his uh, running mate, William Ruto, were using the ICC card where they were suggesting that uh, somebody was trying to victimize them. And so that makes a significant uh, difference. Politicians are also focusing their campaign messages on corruption, high cost of living, insecurity and Kenya's high debt profile. But for many citizens, ethnic consideration rather than economic issues is most likely still to determine their choice later this year. Yes, there are uh, questions of uh, the economy, questions of corruption, questions uh, of uh, perceived uh, poor performance. But all these uh, ultimately are going to be placed on the weighing scales of our uh, ethnicity. A large turnout of the eligible 19 million voters is expected when the elections are held in August. For Voice of Nigeria, I am Ayola Funkoya. And from Kenya, we move to the Central African Republic, where in Turkmenistan, conflicts has displaced more than 100,000 people in two weeks. This is according to the United Nations. Najat Rochi, UN Humanitarian Coordinator of the UN Humanitarian Coordinating Agency, says that one in two people are in need of aid in CAR, which has seen a spike in the fight against rival groups since November 2016. Mihika Ataya has more. The frequency and brutality of attacks in Central African Republic have reached levels not seen since August 2014. That's according to Najat Roshdi, UN Humanitarian Coordinator for the country. Here she is speaking to journalists in Geneva. Since the past three weeks, uh, the signs are very clear. Violence in the Central African Republic has uh, entered a new spiral of escalating conflict and the situation is quickly deteriorating. In the last two weeks alone, over 100,000 people have been newly displaced. Families running for their life, leaving everything behind. More than 100 people have been killed and hundreds more have been wounded, Ms. Roshdi said. Nika Acharya, United Nations, Geneva. You're listening to 60 Minutes, an hour of news, views, report, and analysis of issues coming to you from Voice of Nigeria, broadcasting from Abuja and also live streaming on www.von.gov.ng. It's now time for economic news, and let's join Florence Adi. Thank you, and welcome to Economic News. Nigeria's government has mandated the recently appointed executive management team of the Federal Mortgage Bank of Nigeria to reposition the bank for greater efficiency. The managing director of the bank, Mr. Ahmed Dangiwa, said this in a meeting between the bank executive management team and heads of selected primary mortgage banks. Voice of Nigeria's correspondent, Nante James, has known. 
Mr. Dengiwan was had a strategically important role played by primary mortgage banks in the operations of the bank. Being the only disbursement channels for National Housing Fund, Mr. Dengiwan noted that the strategically important role played by primary mortgage banks in the operations of the bank, being the only disbursement channels for National Housing Fund mortgage loans as prescribed by the National Housing Fund Act. He outlined the focus of the new team as to encourage public-private partnerships for housing delivery to leverage private investments to bridge housing finance gap and to stimulate a viable mortgage system. He however promised to work towards the resolution of nagging issues in the system to create an efficient operating environment for the overall benefit of Nigerians. The Standard Organization of Nigeria has received a commendation from the Acting President, Professor Yemi Oshimbajo, at a recent Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises Clinic held in Calabar, Cross River State, Southern Nigeria. Speaking during a visit to the SOM exhibition stand at the occasion held in Calabar, Professor Oshimbajo acknowledged the recent efforts of the organization in promoting the federal government's initiative on the ease of doing business in Nigeria. Mr. Dom Pedro, who represented the Director General of SON, Dr. Osita Aboloma, enumerated the mandate of SON as including the provision of relevant Nigerian industrial standards as a benchmark for quality of products and services offered in Nigeria. It stated further that great emphasis is placed on the grooming of boarding micro, small and medium enterprises using the instrument of standardization. This is said to support the industrialization efforts of the government as well as promote cost consumer safety. And that ends the economic news at Am Florence Adidi. On this edition of 60 Minutes, it's now time to rejoin Kaman Igoche for News Without Nigeria. Welcome back, Kaman. Thank you so much, Glory. The Miners Association of Nigeria has appealed to the Ministry of Mines and Steel Development to grant the newly inaugurated board of the Solid Mineral Development Fund autonomy to, execu to execute its mandate. President of the association, Sani Shehu, made the appeal in an interview with journalists in Abuja. Mr. Shehu said the board would require independence to effectively execute its mandate as stipulated in the mineral and Mining Act 2007. The President said the Mineral and Mining Act 2007 stipulates how funds should be generated and utilized by the Board, adding that they were unable to achieve these during his tenure. The National Agency for Food, Drug Administration and Control, NAFDAC, says it has waived 50% on registration fee for locally manufactured products to promote small and medium scale enterprises. The NAFDAQ spokesperson, Dr. Abubakar Jimo, told journalists in Abuja that the measure would go a long way to promote economic development in the country. He said that the measure was in response to federal government's policy to promote locally manufactured companies in order to boost the economy of the country. An Edo state government has appealed to leaders of communities in the state to work together in maintaining government assets in their communities. Edo State Governor Godwin Obaseki gave the charge while inspecting a gully erosion site at Ihebe, which had eaten a part of the Sabogida Ora Auchi Road on Owan East local government area of the state. He blamed the local government for neglecting their responsibility and said he would fix the road while the local government would bear the cost. And lastly, on news about Nigeria, the Federal Road Safety Corps, FRSC Plateau State Command, has convicted 66 motorists for various road traffic offenses. The sector commander in the state, Mrs. Pat Emodi, disclosed this in an interview with journalists in Joss, the Plateau State Capital. Mrs. Emodi said the measure would go a long way in reducing road traffic accidents and ensure safety of motorists and commuters on the highways. The sector commander added that the Corps was determined to reduce the rate of road traffic crashes in the state. And that was News About Nigeria. Back to you now, Glory. Thank you very much. News About Nigeria, they're presented by Kaman Igoche. It's now time for sports news. Let's do Leko Shwandi.
Thanks for staying there. Welcome to Sports News. The Chairman Senate Committee on Sports in Nigeria, Obi Naoba, has been speaking on the significance of the Nigerian Football Federation Bill, which was recently passed by the country's upper legislature. Speaking with newsmen in Abuja, Senator Ogwa said the bill, if signed into law, will reduce series of court cases relating to football in the country. He also said that the bill would take care of funding, which had been a major problem confronting football matters. For instance, we are about to play Kenya and South Africa. We are waiting for federal government to bring money. But with this bill, is no longer to do the same because they will have money on their own to prescript any competition, any matches that um, involve them. The bill, sponsored by Senator Ogba, if signed into law by the executive, will now bring laws governing football in Nigeria in line with what is obtainable globally. The Super Eagles will fly to Uyo, the Aquaibon state capital, next week ahead of their African Cup of Nations qualifier against South Africa. The Nigerian national team will resume their preparations for the African Cup of Nations qualifier upon their arrival in Abuja on Friday, June 2nd. The players that prosecuted the friendlies against Kosika and Togo checked out of their Hayat Regency Hotel in Paris on Friday morning. On Thursday, the General Raw side trashed Togo 3 men in their last warm-up game before their meeting with Bafana Bafana next weekend. Media officer of the team, Toy Ibitoy, who spoke on telephone before leaving France, said the spirit in camp is high as every player wants to fight to make the team. We have 20 players in camp. 17 of them have been included in the squad that will play South Africa in June, on the 10th of June. But then, everybody feels a piece of reaction and everybody still fought and work hard like uh, they are going to be part of the team for South Africa. Everybody, Uchi, Asbo, Rico, Radu, Bosun, Sibinu, De, Alampazu, everybody had a place of action and everybody made him worse. Ibitoye also assured Nigerians that the team is mentally and physically ready for the Bafana Bafana. Gent winger Moses Simon, who made the final roster to face South Africa, should by now join the squad in Abuja. Chelsea Looney, Kenneth Omeru, will play his last game as a player of Aliaspo on Saturday before reporting for international duty. John Ogu, Daniel Apeyi, Eddie Onaze, and Moruf Bissot are expected to join the team before their trip to the capital of Aquaibon State. Match day 3 of the CAF Competition Cup group stage will see 8 matches played across the African continent this weekend with group A and C completely level heading into a crunch round of fixtures. Action gets underway on Friday with group B leaders MC Ogia is away to Mbambin Swallows in November. A late evening game sees a North African derby between FUS Rabat and Club Africans in Morocco. Should either FUS Rabat or Club Africans manage the victory, it will put them in charge of Group A, which currently has all four teams leveled on three points. The second Group A clash between KCCA of Uganda and Rivers United of Nigeria in Kampala kickstarts Saturday's action. This match is quickly followed by a must-win clash for Japanese side CF Monana, who must beat Guinea visitors Oroya at home to keep alive their hope in Group D. The late game on Saturday sees Egypt's Moa host Sudan's Al Ilal Abiyid in Group C. This is another pool where all four teams are locked on three points apiece. The group's other match takes place on Sunday afternoon in Ndola and sees Sesco United host Angola's Recreativo Bilibobo. South African side Super Sport United and Platinum Stars face top trips on Sunday with a former taking on reigning champion Tipu Masembe in Lubumbashi in Group D while the latter face three-time champion CS Passien in Group B. In basketball, FIBA has confirmed the shortlist of candidates in the running to host the FIBA Basketball World Cup in 2023. Russia and Turkey, who have successful basketball traditions at both European and world levels, are the two nations submitting single host bids. They are joined by a pair of bids consisting of a multiple host countries. The Asian basketball crazy territories of Indonesia, Japan and Philippines are teaming up in one, while America's neighbors and basketball fanatics Argentina and Uruguay make up the other. Other nations interested in being a part of the FIBA Basketball World Cup in 2023 up until the end of August when candidature files are to be submitted to join any of these existing candidacies. 
Those who are the latest on sport news, my name is Lee Konsho Wande. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Leko. It's now time for Today in History, which chronicles some of the major events that occurred on this of the month in history. On this day in 2006, the United Nations Security Council added a thousand peacekeepers to its mission in Ivory Coast in renewed efforts to restore order in the troubled West African country. And on this day in 2007, the Comoros and Guinea joined the community of Sahel Saharan State at a summit of the nine year old African grouping in Libya, raising its membership to 25 countries. Still on this day in 2007 in Zambia, at least 12 soccer fans were crushed to death as a crowd rushed from the Lusaka Stadium after Zambia's victory over Congo Brazzaville in an African Cup qualifier. And on this day in 2012, Kenyan troops were officially integrated into the African Union's peacekeeping mission in Somalia, with Kenya's defense minister signing on agreements at an African Union headquarters in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And that's today in history. I am Faustina Ayamwebe. And now time for our African proverb. When a kid goat bends down, it suckles from its mother's breast. When a kid goat bends down, it suckles from its mother's breast. It simply means that with humility, you can get what you need from those who are elderly or who know more than you. So, a little bit of humble pie wouldn't be bad for you. Be humble today. And to end this edition of 60 Minutes, I look at some of the major stories that we brought to you. Nigeria will spend over $180 million to combat piracy in a bid to safeguard its waters and vessels moving in and out of the country. Minister of Transportation Rotina Amechi stated this in a speech at Nor Shipping Inaugural Africa Podium in Oslo, Norway. At least 15 children have died in South Sudan early May after health workers vaccinated them against measles used the same syringe without sterilizing it. We also brought you news that the United Nations says the decision by the United States to withdraw from the Paris Climate Change Agreement is a disappointment to global efforts to reduce greenhouse emissions and promote global security. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres set off this in New York shortly after U.S. President Donald Trump announced his country's withdrawal from the agreement. Listen to Voice of Nigeria online as you log on to www.von.gov.ng Join our growing Twitter community on the handle at Voice of Nigeria. You can also send us news as it breaks from your listening post. Mail them to vonnews24 at gmail.com. That is vonnews24 at gmail.com. Production was by Beatrice Kozar. And I am Glory Ohago. Thanking you for listening and urging you to stay on for more programs on the English service of Voice of Nigeria. And you listen to that there was our news magazine 60 Minutes from the English service of Voice of Nigeria. And still to come, our last program on this segment is Theatre on the Air, taking there at 19 hours Greenwich Mean Time, just a few moments from now. And now we'll just take this short musical break to take us until that time.
Give it all for